Hi everyone and good morning First Baptist. I'm Mike. And I'm Adam. Thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. Share Your Christmas begins today. Gift trees with toy requests are at the entrances of the worship center and at the church office. Return the gift unwrapped with the tag by December 10th. Monetary donations are always welcome. Make checks payable to First Baptist. Note SYC and designate specific amounts toward gifts and or food on the check. So excited about that. What a fabulous time of year. Christmas at Fellowship Park is also coming December 2nd from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Fellowship Park. There will be live music, a live nativity, free hot dogs, hot cocoa and cookies, and a chance to meet Santa and Mrs. Claus. This is a great opportunity to invite friends and family members for a fun, Christ-centered community event. That's great. This year's International Mission Study, hosted by the WMU, is on Zambia, Africa. Our speaker is Dr. Shelley Kilpatrick, she will share about Zambia and her experiences there. The meal will be food from Zambia. It'll be $5 a person. Kids 12 and under $3. Preschool free. Register by December 1st on our website or at the church office. Child care is available. Awesome. Also, FBC's book club will be meeting on December 7th at 6.30 p.m. in the library. They will be discussing a book titled When the Day Comes by Gabrielle Meyer. Make sure to get a copy, start reading, and join them in, de in December. Church office is closed this Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. There's an on-call sheet in the worship guide. If you need something while we're away, we'll be back on Monday in the office. That's right. It's hard to believe Thanksgiving is here, but it is. If this is your first time in worship with us, we invite you to text the word GUEST to 417-282-8322. You can also visit our info hub after the service where we can meet you and help you connect with First Baptist. Hey Mike, let's worship. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are listening on the radio or watching online as well. Let's begin with a reading from God's Word, a responsive reading from Psalm 136. Let's stand together. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders, who by his understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To the one who remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. And who gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Let's sing together hymn 636. Come, ye thankful people, come.
worship by singing Count Your Blessings, hymn 585. We thank you for the privilege it is to freely worship you among our church family, our fellow brothers and sisters who trust in you and worship you in this life alongside us week after week. Father, as we focus on what it means to live lives of gratitude this week, please remind us that giving thanks is an act of worship and trust in you, our provider. Please remind us, Lord, that everything we have is from you and that it all belongs to you. It's all truly yours, God, and so I pray that in times of abundance and in times of want, we will hold everything we have loosely because it's all a gift and it all belongs to you. I pray that we will live our lives with a posture of surrender, taking time to notice the good gifts you have given and especially giving thanks for who you are, all that you have already done, and what you are doing among us, and all that you have entrusted to us. May we use every resource you have placed in our care to worship you and to your glory. Lord, we repent of the times, myself especially, that we have held on to the resources you've given us too tightly, forgetting your generosity and faithfulness toward us. I repent of the moments that I personally have forgotten the ways you give us daily grace to sustain us, God, apart from our own strivings. You have already given us all that we need, Lord, we especially praise you for the sacrifice of your only son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. As we give this offering, Father, I pray that we will remember that you've given us more than we deserve to steward to further your kingdom, and you've only asked us to bring 10% back to the church. Help us to remember that you meet all of our needs. We pour out our gratitude for your faithful provision in our lives. Help us, Father, to loosely hold all that we have and to offer it back to you for your glory until we see you face to face. Together today, we lift up our hearts of thanksgiving and bring sacrifices of praise to you. May you receive all the glory and all the honor forever and ever. It is in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Let's continue our worship with a reading from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. Let's sing together hymn 576, Give Thanks. Let's stand together as we sing. As we continue our Thanksgiving mini-series this week, would you take your Bible and join me in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that is very well known. We know as the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, but perhaps when you think about the theme rejoicing with Jesus or a Thanksgiving message, it is another one that doesn't immediately come to mind. Hopefully by the time we finish the message today, the reason why we're looking at it and what it says about Thanksgiving will become abundantly clear. As you find your way there, let me just remind you all also, today the way we'll end our service and we'll work our way to it is we'll end by uh, taking communion, celebrating the Lord's Supper together today. And I'll say more about that, but I would just say, therefore, as I preach today, I, I think it's also just good for us to have personal reflection and... Uh, you know, ask ourselves, where am I at with the Lord? Am I walking in faith and obedience to the Lord so you can prepare your heart throughout this service to take the Lord's Supper? With that in mind, I want to begin this morning perhaps in somewhat of an unusual or different way. In 1976, a very well-known African-American preacher by the name of S.M. Lockridge preached what became a very well-known sermon called, That's My King. And in this sermon, there was an excerpt, 
in which he described from his perspective what it's like to have Jesus as king, or better yet, what Jesus' characteristics as king are like. Not in a cheap knockoff imitation way this morning, because I could never do it in his style. But if you would allow, I just want to read a small section of what he said in that sermon as you consider what this means for us today. This is what Pastor Lockridge said about Jesus as king. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can defy his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. I wonder if you know him. Well, my king is the king. He is the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his office is manifold, his promise is sure, his light is matchless, his good, goodness is limitless, his mercy is everlasting, his love never changes, his word is enough, his grace is sufficient, his reign is righteous, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's invisible. He's irresistible. I wonder, as we enter into the week of Thanksgiving, if we consider and understand what it means for Jesus to be our King. To say it another way, do we understand what it's like to live in Jesus' kingdom? To live as residents of Jesus' kingdom now. Maybe that leads to a very important question that we don't often think about and certainly don't explain in this way. Are you thankful, if he is, that Jesus is your king? We might not think of this passage that I have led us to today in that way, but I think when considered in the light context, what Jesus teaches at the first part of this passage that we know as the Sermon on the Mount gets to that very point. What does it mean for Jesus to be my king? And if he is, am I rejoicing over that fact? The part in the Gospel of Matthew that the Sermon on the Mount falls is significant. Matthew begins his Gospel. He introduces Jesus to us in chapter 1 and 2 in the context of the birth narrative. And in the birth narrative, he shows us that Jesus and his coming is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. To say it another way, Jesus is the long-awaited and promised king of Israel. You do not have to wait for another. Then in Matthew chapter 3, we see his baptism. Matthew chapter 4, in some ways, his ministry or his public presentation begins in earnest. First of all, with his temptation in the wilderness, and then after that with his calling his disciples followed by him ministering, at least as Matthew describes it generically, to the masses. Matthew chapter 5 then transitions and shows us a specific example of Jesus' ministry. Perhaps for us, if we're tracing along in the New Testament, it is the first sermon of Jesus that we come to. We know Matthew chapter 5 through 7 
as the Sermon on the Mount. And we want to look at the passage that begins this Sermon on the Mount. And as we do, I would submit to you that in this teaching, Jesus presents something to us that is worth our rejoicing, that is worthy, although we don't often think of it this way, of us giving our thanks. With that in mind, I, I want to show you this passage in three points that I've pulled out for you, what we might call the setup, the sayings, and the significance. To begin with, look with me at verses 1 and 2. And as we do that, we see what I've called the setup for the king's sermon. This is what we read. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Now, on the surface, you might look at these first two verses and say, Adam, this is just simply the introduction to the good stuff. It's kind of a sterile passage. There's, there's not much that we gain from this, and so we don't need to spend much time on it. I, I would certainly tell you that it is the introduction, but even in this introduction, it says something to us about who Jesus is talking to and perhaps why he's saying what he's saying to them. And it helps us frame and make sense of why it is that what he's saying not just matters to us, but is worthy of us giving thanks. Who he's talking to and the location upon which he's saying it. I, you might get tired of me doing this. I, I do this on occasion. I, I don't do it because I think you need this information in order to understand God's Word, in order to have it applied to your life. But sometimes when, when we can see or have described to us where some of these events took place, it helps us make a little bit more sense of why Jesus might have done what he did or why the events were such as they were. I've had the opportunity two different times to go to Israel and on both occasions went to the traditional site where Jesus gave this sermon. It's called the Mount of Beatitudes. And on that hillside on the top of it is a church and on the back side of that church is uh, what we might call a hillside that kind of creates a natural amphitheater. We believe that that is where Jesus, or at least close to it, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, presented this message. And the reason he perhaps would have done that has to do to some extent with amplification of sound. In a day where you didn't have electric amplification of sound, how did you present a teaching to a larger crowd? Well, you would find natural ways for sound to carry. One is with an amphitheater behind you, and another is over water. It would help sound to carry. So we believe that that's where Jesus perhaps delivered this message. And when we say that in verses 1 and 2, there's something here that's said to us about who was his primary audience. And a lot of times we don't pay attention to this or understand why his primary audience matters. Do you notice that he sees the crowd? He says, seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain and his disciples came to him and opening his mouth to teach them, he said, or saying. So in other words, we see in the first two verses that Jesus' primary audience wasn't the masses, but it was his disciples. Now, why does that matter for this passage of Scripture? Well, to put it in terms of what we're talking about here, to some extent, who he's talking to is those who in some shape, form, or fashion have already professed that they're following him or desire to follow him. To say it another way, perhaps those in, 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 whom, in whose life are recognizing that Jesus is indeed this king that God promised and has now come. These are the ones that Jesus is talking to that in some shape, form, or fashion, perhaps the king is already reigning in their hearts now. They're already a part of God's kingdom. Now, that's significant. And one of the reasons it's significant is sometimes we look at what we read and what Jesus says. If we don't know the audience he's talking to, we can get very legalistic. We say, well, what Jesus is talking about here is how you gain entrance into the kingdom, how you're saved. But Jesus here is not so much talking about how you gain entrance into the kingdom. 
as much as his point is by his audience, what should you live like as a kingdom residence? How should you live as someone that claims that Jesus is your king in the here and now, even in the world in which we find ourselves? That's what Jesus is talking about. Yet at the same time, we go back to what I just said. There's no doubt that he saw the crowd, that he went to a place where his words could be amplified. So could it be that he's primarily focusing on those that know him or have attached themselves to him, but at the same time, he has not lost perspective that there is a larger crowd that may be hearing him. He's talking about living in the kingdom to those in the kingdom. But he's presenting the kingdom to those who need to come in to the kingdom. It's a little bit like, if I can explain it this way, and I don't mean this in a bad way, what we do on Sunday mornings and why we do it. We think about what we do on Sunday morning, who is the primary audience? Well, we call it worship. So if we call it Sunday morning worship, primarily what we're saying is what we do and how we focus on it is primarily for those that know Christ to worship him and hear his word so that we're edified and we follow him. Yet at the same time, we open our our arms widely and say we desire and hope that those in the world will still feel welcome and, and come join us because there's a message for them as well. They need to see who we are, what we believe, so perhaps their life will be changed as well. Now, to be honest with you, this is also, in some extent, what we see patterned in the New Testament. Who were most of the books in the New Testament written to? Churches, which is primarily made up of believers. But that doesn't mean there's not an invitation. That doesn't mean that there's not an application for those that don't know him. So it's as if Jesus is primarily talking to those that know him, yet with an eye towards the larger crowd. In some ways, this helps us make sense of our question. If he's primarily talking to those that are living in the kingdom now, then maybe we can begin to make sense. That becomes important for why it is that this message is a call to us to give thanks, a call for us to rejoice. And you might say, well, how is that the case? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to dig in a little deeper to what it is that Jesus actually says in the sermon. We don't just see the setup for the king's sermon, but in verses 3 through 10, we've called what I've called the sayings to the king's subjects. What is it that he's actually saying to those that claim to know him, that claim to be a part of his kingdom, that are attempting to follow him now? Well, look with me, if you would, in verses 3 through 10 as we attempt to answer that question. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You look at this passage of Scripture, and one of the first questions that often come to mind with people is, why is this called, called the Beatitudes? I don't, I don't see that word anywhere in my English translation. The reason it's called the Beatitudes is because that is called that after the Latin word that is translated blessed, and in the Latin New Testament, each of these next nine verses begin with that word. In the, original, in the original text, in the original Greek, the Greek equivalent in the plural of the word blessed begins the next eight verses. Blessed are the ones. Blessed are the ones. Blessed are the ones. In Greek, word order matters in the sentence. You might say, why is that? Well, the reason it matters is because in ancient Greek and in, uh, in, in, in In classical Greek, you didn't have things like underlining, bold set type. So if you wanted to emphasize something and say, this is what I'm trying to get you to focus on, you would often front load it in the part of the sentence to say, this is what matters. 
Jesus actually does that with the word blessed in the next nine verses. And here we see it in the next eight. Blessed, blessed, blessed. What Jesus is trying to say and what Matthew is recording for us is this. Jesus is emphasizing who it is that's truly blessed by implying how it is that they're blessed. To think of it this way, it's a little bit like what we read, if you remember, in Psalm 1. You remember how Psalm 1 begins? Blessed is the man. Jesus here is explaining to us what truly being blessed is especially as it relates to this world. Now, for just a moment, before we even dig into any of the specifics of what we see, think about this for a moment. Jesus is actually making a statement that's a matter of fact. He's not saying based on how you feel. He, he's not saying about the world's perspective. He, he, he's not even saying you need to in, intellectually understand this. He's just making a statement, this is true. This is what being blessed looks like. This is how it's described. Now, let me just tell you how important I think that is for us, even in this world today. The world can convince us otherwise. The world can tell us what true blessing is, and we can get very caught up in that. And our emotions, I'm not one that thinks we need to set aside all of our emotions. God created us with emotions, but we need to understand our emotions just like every part of us is human and therefore can be flawed. So Jesus is saying regardless of how you feel, this is what it means to be blessed. Now for a moment, even if we just read them on the surface, here's what's fascinating, isn't it? Most of these things are not things that the world would pursue. To say it another way, they're not things that the world would value to say, I wish this were true of me. Uh, the world and all of its kingdoms, in some ways, has something in common. It seeks power and position and prestige. And most of these things don't fit in that type of a kingdom. It fits in a different kingdom, a kingdom of a different order, an upside-down kingdom, if you will, Jesus' kingdom. So with that in mind, let's just think for a moment about the individual Beatitudes. There is some argument as to how to best divide these up to understand them, and there are several theories out there. I'm not saying this is the right one or the only right one. But the one that I like the best that helps me make sense of it is putting it in three categories. Verses 3 and 4, the beatitude that talks about our attitude towards our sin. Verses 5 through 8, beatitudes that talk about our attitude towards the Savior. And then the final two verses, verses 9 and 10, beatitudes that talk about our attitude towards society. So the beatitudes about sin... The Beatitudes about the Savior, the Beatitudes about society. So with that in mind, let's just look at them in a little bit more detail. Verses 3 and 4. Beatitudes about our sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Isn't this interesting? Blessed are the poor in in spirit. Certainly we understand that poor could be a reference to, to economic status and that might have some application, but it doesn't seem to be that that's Jesus' main thrust here. Why? Because he puts a qualifier on it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now what in the world is Jesus talking about? I, I actually think what he's talking about is blessed is the person or the people that come to the place that understand in and of their own souls, they have nothing to offer God for their own salvation that will make them right with Him. They come to understand the depravity and depths of their own sinfulness and understand that before a holy God, they are bankrupt. And it is them that recognize that Jesus has come as the Savior. They recognize that they need the Savior, and therefore they are the ones of whom it can be said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because they are the ones that have come to recognize in their sin their need for the Savior. 
Along the same lines, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Again, it can be talking about death and loss. In context, I, I'm not so certain that it's not talking about mourning for their sin, mourning for their own unrighteousness. Even after we've been saved, we know that we continue to battle our fleshly desires and our sinful nature. And those that truly know him, those that, that own Jesus as their king, and whose heart the king is already ruling, we are broken over our own sin. And we long for that day of glorification, not just justification, but glorification when we're f- set free from this body of sin and death. And so now we mourn. We're broken over our sin. And there's a promise that one day we shall be comforted. Our attitude towards our sin. Verses 5 through 8, we see that these are the attitude of those that would submit to, would see, think about, and choose to serve the Savior. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek. You know, the funny thing is, a lot of times, even 21st century, specifically American Christians, don't really understand what the word meek means. We hear that word, and still so many people think it is a synonym with weak. It is not. In many ways, it is the exact opposite of weak. Meek doesn't mean weak. It actually means strength under control. That's the idea. And for those of us that know Jesus as our king, the idea is our strength, who we are, has been brought under submission, obedience, and control of our Lord. That's what it's talking about. There are some scholars that argue that the word in the original context, the original culture that it's being used here, the the way it was used was to to, uh, characterize horses who had been broken. Well, think about that for a moment. Is a horse, even one that's been broken, weak? Far from it. We still use reference to horses and horsepower to talk about the strength of engines, don't we? Because horses are very powerful animals. But what about, what about one that's been broken? It is strength under control. Look at the next one we see here, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The idea is being one that hungers and thirsts for the righteousness of God. And when you hunger and thirst for something, that indicates that you're, you're hungry for it. You have a great desire for it. You want to pursue it. And for those that are thirsty and hungry for the things of God, God one day will give it to us because that's what He wants us to have anyway. And so we desire the righteousness of Christ, and God promises that we'll have it. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We ourselves are creation of God's grace. We have seen, we have received mercy. And if anybody in this world is going to go out and model and show mercy in this world, It should be us. We perhaps best represent the Savior when we are known as merciful people. We go out and extend the mercy of God. And then look at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A lot of people believe this is a reference to Psalm 24, or at least part of it. Maybe you don't remember Psalm 24. This is when the psalmist is asking the question, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? A fancy way of saying, who can be in his presence? Who can go to where God is? Who can go to the temple? And the psalmist begins to give some answers. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his hands to idols. The idea is true here. Jesus is, if you will, putting a new application on it. Who is it that will see God? Those who are blessed, who have a pure heart, a pure heart that comes only from him. Beatitudes towards sin, beatitudes towards the Savior, and finally, beatitude towards society, verses 9 and 10. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Isn't this interesting? Blessed are the peacemaker. 
Now, I, I would say I certainly think this is probably in some ways a reference to peace between people, peace between nations. We shouldn't be those that seek war, but peace. But I think more than this, again, I'm not so certain that this is referring to something spiritual. Uh, what is it that we should be known as? And think about this. What do sons of God refer to? Who is most like their father other than the children of the father? So if you really want to be known to be like God, Jesus says go out and be a peacemaker. I'm not so certain that this isn't a reference to what we read in a place like 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. It has been given to us the word of reconciliation. Peace in the cross has been made between us and God. And we are those who now are to go out and to communicate, to declare that peace, and to try to bring reconciliation through the message of the cross to others and God as well. That is our primary calling and our primary aim towards society. And then verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's an interesting perspective, isn't it? When we are persecuted, certainly it seems like any time anybody tries to go out and do the work of the Lord in a, in a, in a society that doesn't understand the kingdom of Christ, there's always the possibility of having those that persecute us, that would desire our, our harm, would want to uh, do us ill. And Jesus says amazingly that when that happens to you for the sake of righteousness, you are, you are blessed indeed. Because again, it shows what kingdom we belong to. I think here a little bit about the words of Jesus in in, in John's gospel during the high priestly prayer where Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. So we look at these descriptions of this statement of fact of Jesus. Blessed are the ones. And what I find fascinating that we need to state right here at this point is is that Jesus is making a statement about being blessed that, hear me say this, has nothing to do about what you think about or what you feel regarding your state of blessedness. In other words, again, it's not how you feel about it. It's not what you think about it. Objectively, Jesus the King is saying this is what it means. These are the qualities. This is what it looks like. To be blessed. Amazingly, those that he was speaking to that day would have got what he was saying immediately. As a matter of fact, the, the way he says it would have probably caught them off guard. You see, Jesus uses a word, this concept of being blessed, that in that day and time was rarely, if ever, used of living human beings. This was a type of internal peace and fortune and soundness that could only be said of the dead or the Greek gods. They were the only ones of whom it could be said are blessed. But Jesus turns around and he uses it for those that are residing in his kingdom in whom he is already reigning in their heart. You see, Jesus here is talking about being blessed in a way that brings about an inner satisfaction and sufficiency that is not dependent upon external circumstances. In some ways, it's despite of external circumstances, but instead is built on a true internal righteousness that can only come from Him. In other words, what kingdom you belong to and who your king is. Now, just for a moment, can, can we be honest? We think about what he's saying here in this statement of fact. That he's, he's calling us blessed if these things are true of us. Where is this on the list of things that you'll be thankful for this week and on Thursday? Um, Holly does something with us every year. It's kind of become kind of tradition. 
and uh, we sit around the table even before we get to our extended family. And at some meal, she'll probably do it today, she says everyone's got to say one thing that they're thankful for, you know. And I'm sure a lot of people do. It's not just us, but that's what we do this time of year. We probably should do it all times of year. And um, I, I've already gotten permission for my kids to share with you, especially one particular. Uh, one year, and by the way, this let me just characterize my kids for you. Um, Ashlyn's the sentimental one. It's always going to be something about family and relationships. That's always going to be where Ashlyn goes. Alex, it's always going to be something to do with sports, although with the Razorbacks this year, he's going to have a hard time with that. <laughs> and Kate usually just kind of smiles and giggles, and we're lucky if we get anything out of her. But Kinley is probably the one that's the most like me. She speaks sarcasm fluently. <laughs> I remember it wasn't too many years ago when it's all serious, we get to her, everyone else has said their piece, and Holly says, Kinley, what are you think thankful for? And without any pause or hesitation and with the most serious face you could ever imagine, she looks up and says, I'm thankful for monkeys. <laughs> Put this in a little bit more context. We, we're not around monkeys. We had not been at the zoo recently. We've never owned a monkey. She's never talked about monkeys before or since, but she was thankful for monkeys. Where is this that we read from Jesus about his kingdom in our list of things that we say, we'll say we're thankful for around the table this year? Can I be honest with you? I, I, I'm kind of pointing that out about my kids, but let me talk about me for just a moment. It's not that the things I say I'm thankful for are, are inherently sinful. They're not. But in some ways, when you think about spiritual matters and what Jesus is saying here, they're kind of shallow. They're self-centered. They're not really spiritual. And what Jesus is saying is perhaps that which you should be most thankful for, not in an arrogant or prideful way, but it's that these things are true of you because if these things are true of you, it says something about what kingdom and who you belong to. Now, the question becomes, is that something that should be worthy this year and every year of us giving things? Well, before you answer that question, Let's consider just one more point from this passage of Scripture. We don't just see the setup. We don't just see the sayings. But finally, in verses 11 and 12, we see what I've called the significance of the king's statements. Listen, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice. Catch this. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, by this point, what I mean is why does it really matter to us? How does it apply to our lives? Funny thing is, I would make an argument about the Beatitudes as a whole that probably to understand what Jesus is really saying, we have to take them together. Not that there's not some things about each individual word, but if we get so deep into what each individual word means, we'll kind of miss Jesus' forest for the trees. And a lot of people look at verses 11 and 12, and some will say there's eight Beatitudes, not nine, even though verse 11 begins with blessed. And they'll say verses 11 and 12 is just a further explanation of the last Beatitude from verse 10 which may make it all the stranger because I'm kind of doing every, undoing everything I've just said. I think for a moment we need to pull out verses 11 and 12 and consider those verses for a moment on their own because in doing so, I think we understand what Jesus is trying to say with the whole. Well, how so? Consider just three or four things. Notice for a moment in verse 11 the obvious, obvious change in, in, in the address that Jesus is making. Well, what do I mean by that? In the previous eight Beatitudes, he is using the third person. Blessed are the ones. Blessed is he. Blessed is she. But that's not what he says in verse 11. What does he say in verse 11? Blessed are you. He has just gone from the generic to the specific. He has just gone from some things that are generally true to something that Jesus is claiming to be true of you. If you know Jesus, if he is your king, then this is true of you. And oh, by the way, by extension, if we know Jesus is king, it's true of us today as well. 
With that in mind, what is it that he's saying is true of us? What's the content of what he actually says? He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Two things are important there, that it's false and that it's for Jesus' account. Not if they're true, not if they're saying true things, but if they're saying false things about us because ultimately we're serving Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus will say we're in good company because in every generation, those that have been a part of his kingdom, that have served him and represented represented his name, there have always been those that attack them. And what Jesus is saying is rejoice and be glad because it's saying something of you that's true. Which really gets to the third thing that I want you to notice here for a moment, verb tense. For a moment, would you go back and look at the previous eight? Here's what you'll notice about every one of the previous Beatitudes except for verse 3 and 10. The second part of the phrase in every one of them is a future tense promise. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's something that will happen. Not true yet. It's something that will happen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall in the future inherit the earth. But look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs shall be the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Nope. Theirs is currently now the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 10, the same thing. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is now currently the kingdom of heaven. Here's what I don't want you to miss. Jesus, in what he's saying in the Beatitudes, is absolutely saying there's a not yet part of the kingdom. We live in a broken world, and we don't get to, in our flesh, enjoy all the promises of God the way we want to yet. There are things that are yet to come. But don't emphasize that so much that you underemphasize what Jesus is saying. There's also an already part of the kingdom. If you know him, and he is your king, and he's redeemed you, there are some things about the kingdom that you get to enjoy now. One of them is that you belong to that kingdom. The question becomes, well, how does that kingdom come about? How is it that that's true of me now? Which, by the way, aren't we now getting into why it is that we should rejoice over this? It's not just something that we eagerly anticipate, although we do, but it's something that we enjoy now. Well, let's rejoice over it now. Let's give thanks over it now. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, how does this come about? Well, just for a moment, Jesus kind of gives the purpose statement for the Sermon on the Mount or the main point in, in chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. And essentially, here's what he says. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. But remember, of these, he said that, that, that theirs is already the kingdom of heaven. Well, how in the world in that day and time could anybody's righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? On the outside, legalistically, they were the most righteous of everyone. Jesus is not talking about an external law-induced righteousness. Jesus is talking about an internal righteousness, a righteousness of a different order that can only come through him redeeming and changing the heart. That's what Jesus is talking about. We become residents of this kingdom in the here and now by Jesus' righteousness alone. Can I say it this way? God's kingdom in Christ does not come through a set of rules to be followed. God's kingdom in Christ comes through the reign of the king who loved us and gave himself up for us. And here's the amazing thing. In the life of the one in whom Jesus is already reigning and ruling, there is no doubt that there is an emphasis here that who we are, what we value, and what we pursue contrast, not in a judgmental way, with the values, the virtues, and the pursuits of the world and this kingdom. And brothers and sisters, when we understand that, yeah, that's something that should be high upon our list of things we're thankful for, of things we rejoice over. This week and every other, 
Um, just You have it in your guide there, but just let me kind of bring this to a point with the spiritual principle. Just hear this for a moment. This is really the point. I, I, I don't want you to miss it. If these values, or excuse me, if these virtues which the world doesn't value are true of us, then we are blessed. It's not you will be blessed. It's not a hope I'm blessed. It's a statement of fact. We are blessed. That's what Jesus is saying, no matter how you feel in the moment. If that's the case, therefore, we should give, we must give our utmost thanks and thanksgiving to Christ as members of His upside-down kingdom. Just, just for a moment as we wrap up, consider this for just a second. Jesus is not saying, if you're a part of His kingdom, you should hope to be blessed. You should seek to be blessed that maybe God will bless you. Jesus is making this statements or these statements as is statements. These are true. In the here and now, you are blessed. You are fortunate. If we're honest for a moment when we read these, uh, it sometimes is even hard for us to really understand that. And the reason why is we've been so conditioned by the world in which we live. And the world in which we live tells us what's good and what's bad, what's a blessing, what's not. And we can so be tempered by that. And we can see things the way the world does and the world describes it. So if we look at these again, the world seeks power, prestige, and position. And all of these things seem like humility and, and being forced down, being low, and being a servant. And many of these things even look like they're difficult or hard circumstances. So the truth of the matter is, here's what we understand. The only way this makes sense is it is not a part. These things are not a part of that kingdom. They're of a different kingdom, a kingdom of a different order, an upside-down kingdom, Jesus' kingdom. So if these things are true of you, it can only mean one thing. You're a part of Jesus' kingdom, and in that you should rejoice and be thankful. In 1973, the great theologian, Gladys Knight, through one of her very popular songs, <laughs> taught us a little bit about the pursuit or desire to live in the kingdom now. Maybe it's one of her most well-known songs. You'll remember the storyline to it. There's a young man that makes his way to a big city, to California, and while he's there, he meets a young lady, and they fall in love. But being a small-town boy, he quickly realizes that he can't live in that world, has no desire to stay there, and so he's telling her he's going back home. And then comes the chorus. He says he's leaving on a midnight train to Georgia, going back to find a simpler place and time. And then comes the good part. And I'll be with him on that midnight train to Georgia, because I would rather live in his world, watch this, than live without him in mine. This teaches us something about living in the kingdom now. Oh, not in a romantic sense, something so much more significant than that. You see, once we've seen Jesus, once we've understood his kingdom, and we understand who he is as king, we will refuse to live in this world without knowing him as king and being with him now. We will do anything necessary to make sure we're living with him and know him as king. And the truth of the matter is, what Jesus is saying, once we realize we're with him, well, brothers and sisters, that's worthy of our thanksgiving. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Gracious Father, as always, we, we do thank you so much for your word. And thank you that today that you give us this picture, this glimpse of, of how your kingdom has come and how it's intended to come and be a part of our hearts, those that claim to know you. My prayer is that this morning that that this message has been encouraging for those that say they know Jesus. I, I pray that it will give us more confidence and more eagerness 
to go out and live as residents of your kingdom, trusting you, obeying you, and representing you. And then, Father, I pray if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, that's not a part of your kingdom because they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, today would be the day of salvation for them. We'll be up here at the front. We'd love to talk with them and pray with them. And whatever you do, Father, we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory, for this is your time. This is your response time. It's not ours. We love you, we thank you, and we pray this and give it to you in the matchless and majestic name of Jesus, our King. Amen and amen. Would you stand and respond as we sing? Let's sing together hymn 577, my tribute. be seated again for just a moment. We want to uh, end today, as we mentioned earlier, by taking the Lord's Supper together. And so when you walked in, there were tables at all of the entrances, and you should have been able to pick up the elements. But if you didn't get those and would like to take the Lord's Supper with us as we conclude, just slip up your hand, and we have some people in the room that can get you the elements. And as they do that, let me just tell you, I want to actually turn our attention to Luke's account of Jesus implementing the Lord's Supper in Luke 22. And before I read that, which I'll do in just a second, just a good reminder that we know when we take the Lord's Supper, this is one of the ordinances that the Lord Jesus himself instituted. And it's, it's for believers, and it's really for believers that, that have hearts that are right with him. So I just encourage you to, to spend some time just reflecting as I talk and read here for a moment. Because we do this collectively together, and as we do, we do so remembering the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. But collectively, we also do so proclaiming to the world that we believe Jesus is coming again. Amen? 
So with that in mind, let me draw our attention to the Lord's table by beginning reading in Luke 22, verse 14. Here's what we read. And when the hour came, he reclined uh, at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. As we begin this morning, would you open and take the bread that represents the body of the Lord and all that he's done for us. And as we do that, would you pray with me this morning? So, our Father in heaven, we do come before you right now, and we thank you for all that is ours in Christ Jesus. We thank you that in Christ, all the promises of God are yes in him. And thank you that Jesus came, took on flesh, and lived the perfect life that we could not, and literally and historically went to the cross and died in our place. And as we take this wafer this morning, help us do so, remembering the body of the Lord Jesus and all that he gave. And as we remember, help us to proclaim we believe he's coming again. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is his body which is given for us. Now would you take and open the cup. And as you do that, would you pray with me once more, blessing the cup, the juice that represents the blood of the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you so much uh, for, for your blood. Thank you that it's only through your blood and in you that we have forgiveness of sin, that our sins, though scarlet, have been washed white as snow by what you've done. Thank you so much. We pray that you would bless the cup, bless the fruit of the vine, and as we take it, help us to remember what you've done for us and the sacrifice that you've given. Lord, not to, own, not to earn our salvation, but Father, help us, Lord Jesus, help us to live worthy of what you've done for us and who we are in you. Bless this cup as we receive it this morning. And it is in your matchless and worthy name that we pray these things. Amen. This cup is the new covenant in his blood. As we wrap up today and before we have our benediction, let me just mention to you, and I've forgotten to do it in the previous two services, it is our pattern that when we take the Lord's Supper on the way out, we always take a an offering, a special offering for world hunger. And so there will be those that have buckets. If you want to give an offering, 100% of that will go to world hunger. So you can do that on your way out. And Brett's going to come and do the benediction. And as he does that, let me just say this to you. It is interesting how Luke chooses to end this account. It's not like some of the others we see where it was rejoicing. They went out to the Mount of Olives and they sang a hymn. No, Luke uh, recollects that Jesus spoke about him being betrayed. But that, brothers and sisters, is even good news for us because God, through this betrayal, used to bring about the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ for us. So let's depart today and let's reflect over Thanksgiving and be thankful of the good news of Jesus Christ and that we have a way to know and be right with the Father. God bless you. Have a great Thanksgiving. Brett will come and lead us in our benediction now. Just a few things before we go. If you would like to talk to a pastor about uh, following Jesus or being part of First Baptist or being baptized, any of those things, we want to have those conversations. If you want to text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322.
uh, we will contact you sometime this week to set up a conversation, or if you want to have those conversations this morning, we're available to have those face-to-face. -face. Um, also, if this is one of your first times worshiping with us, and maybe you haven't had a chance to meet Pastor Adam yet, he would love to meet you. Uh, he'll be down here in this hospitality room right after the service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, thank you for your word, how you've revealed yourself to us, Lord, and how you've shown us uh, the true way to blessing. Uh, thank you uh, for this time of worship together. We just pray that we would continually reflect on the truth of your word throughout this week, that we would uh, live in the way that you have called us to, Lord. Help us to be thankful for the many ways that you bless us, but help us to also live in a way that glorifies you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 